Okay, folks, the word of God is alive and powerful, never changes, and it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow is a critic of the thoughts and intents of the heart. All scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be mature, thirty furnished into all good works. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We're going to take just a moment of time to prepare ourselves for the study of God's word through the technique of rebound and operation cry. You know the techniques, so with your heads bowed and eyes closed, you make your own way with the Lord through the confession of your own personal sins. And I'll close out our prayer time and pick up our study right where we left off after we make a couple of announcements. Father, there's so much going on in the world today, a lot about which we know nothing. It's the, the deception, the deceit, the fraud, the lies that are back behind the scene, that are actually uh, moving forward the events of the circumstances of this day. It's amazing how much we don't know. That's about the circumstances, the things that are going on behind the scenes that are driving what we see happening today. Well, that in mind, Father, we've got a solution here in the 11 principles for national renewal. And this morning, when we take a look at the natural tendency of government, it's going to it's going to help to explain again much of what's going on. This is just another piece of the puzzle. So that when we take these 11 principles, and Father, quite honestly, this is not information that we don't already know. Most of us that are online with us today uh, are familiar with the teaching that I've been doing for the last many, many years. And so it's just helping us to put the spotlight on what's taking place in this particular period of human history. So I would ask that you confirm for us the truth of your word as we take a look at the, nor the natural tendency of government. Well, we're looking at government today, we see all that's going on, but what we need to realize is a natural tendency in all this that comes from a biblical, biblical viewpoint. So teach us this morning in Christ's name, amen. Well, let's uh, again announce the the subject, the natural tendency of government. This is principle number six in the in the book titled uh, 11 Principles of National Renewal. But I also want to make mention again, two weeks from this Sunday, June the 12th, we'll be meeting at American Pie Pizza. Please mark your calendar. And if you plan to attend, let me know so I can take care of the seating and also the notes. Okay, with that in mind, now let's turn to our let's turn to our lesson. And it's a, it's just another amazing set of set of truth. The title of the, the title of the the book, the subtitle, the Return to God Journey Guide. Now let me point out something here. What we have in these eleven chapters is biblical. It's just that a friend of mine, um, Sam Rohr, who's the president of the American Pastors Network wrote this little guide, and uh, I, I was so uh, taken back by it that I felt like we needed to to teach this, so that you will realize that there are other people in the United States who see this exactly the same way we do. Well, the the real title is the Eleven Principles of National Renewal, and we are now in Chapter Six which is the natural tendency of government. Let's start right there. There was a man by the name of Lord Acton, A-C-T-I-N. I'm going to talk, uh, talk to you about him just briefly, but he was a man who is described as the magistrate of history. Listen to what I'm saying. He was described as the magistrate of history in the 
uh, in the recent in recent decades. He's one of the great personalities of the 19th century and is universally, that means everywhere, considered to be one of the most learned Englishmen of his time. He made the history of li uh, liberty his life's work. What did he do? What did he study? He made the history of liberty his life's work. Now, we've already defined and describe the difference between liberty and freedom. Liberty is what God has what God has given us, given every human being, and that means freedom from tyranny. Liberty is freedom from tyranny. Now, when you stop and think about this, if you are free from tyranny, then you have liberty and you have the right to execute all of the rights that God has given you. But if the if you have a tyrannical government, whether it's a federal government, a state government, a, a city government, a county government, or hey, how about this? The the boss where you work, the principal in the school, the policeman on the street. See, God has delegated authority to certain people. And as long as there is not there is no tyranny, you are free from tyranny. You are then you have you you have liberty with which you are able to execute your freedom. So without liberty, there is no freedom. Jesus Christ, when he paid for our sins on the cross, prior to that. We were tyrannized by the old sin nature. But Jesus Christ, by his work on the cross, has set us free from sin. So now, understanding that difference then between liberty and freedom, this Lord Acton was a great personality again in the 19th century, and he made his, he made the history of liberty, not freedom, the history of liberty, his life's work. And indeed, he considered political liberty, political liberty, the essential condition and guardian of religious liberty. Hmm, that's rather interesting. Because if you take a look at what's going in our country today, on a lesser scale than other places in the world, but religious liberty is tyrannized by governments all over the world. And we find this happening at least in a minimum kind of a way. We'll see it happen here, happen there, someplace else, an isolated event, where we see tyranny of religion, religion tyrannized in this country. So Lord Acton actually made his life work studying the history of liberty. Now we're not freedom, liberty. Okay. Get the tyranny out of out of our lives. Secondly, Lord Acton also made a comment. And by the way, let's go to point one. Point one, after having described who this guy is, Lord Acton actually said, power, now stop and think about this, power tends to corrupt. And absolute power corrupts absolutely. Now, he was a man who actually made many, many quotes, and I will share some of them with you here uh, at the end of class if we have time. But Lord Acton also said, authority that does not exist for liberty. What is the purpose for, for uh, authority? Authority is for the purpose of liberty. Authority is given to us to protect our liberty, not to do something for us, not to give something to us, not to control our lives, but listen to me, please. Authority was delegated by God to mankind for the purpose of protecting liberty, not freedom. Without liberty, there is no freedom. He's protecting our liberty. So Lord Acton said, authority that does not exist for liberty is not authority, but it's force. You take, you take, 
liberty out of the way, and authority then becomes for force. Look at look at his first statement. Power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Now, in point two, sub point one, what Lord Acton was saying when he said authority that does not exist for liberty is not authority but force, what Lord Acton is saying is that fallen sinful human beings, fallen human beings, in other words, um, Adam, Adam fell in the garden. He lost his righteousness. He passed the old sin nature onto every human being so that the moment of physical birth, we are fallen human beings. We, are, uh, we, we don't have the, the righteousness that God has. Adam lost that. Eve lost it. He passed that fallen nature on to us, and we're sinful human beings. So he said what, what uh, he was saying then is that fallen sinful human beings, when given positions of power and authority, stop there. When fallen sinful human beings, all this means is, is that when you have an, an elected and or an appointed human being, whether that whether that's a male, a female, black, white, rich, poor, you understand that. But if it's a fallen, sinful human being, when given positions of power and authority, what will that person do? That person will maybe once no, look at it, will naturally tend to abuse that power and authority. Now let's see what this brilliant man said again. He's, he was saying that fallen sinful human beings, when given positions of power and authority, and how do they get that power and authority? Either by you and I electing these people, or somebody appointing someone to this position of authority. But if this person is a fallen sinful human being, an unbeliever, how about this, or a carnal believer, when that person is given a position of power and authority, that person will naturally tend to abuse that power and authority. Now, what we need here is a little application time. Take that statement. That fallen sinful human beings, when given positions of power and authority, will naturally tend to abuse that power and authority. A contemporary application to our present federal administration abusing their power, abusing their authority. It will either be by passing unconstitutional laws. It will either be by writing an executive order that is unconstitutional. It may be a, a, a Supreme Court justice or maybe five of the nine judging something to be right or constitutional. Only the truth of the matter is it isn't. And by the way, let me point out something to you. I mean, it was Mark Levin within the last oh, couple of weeks was making a comment about the idea that the Supreme Court is the final authority in all matters regarding constitutionality. So that our present uh, governor in the state of Arkansas told me and is telling people and has told people that if the if the federal if, if the um, if the Supreme Court has made a decision, we are forced to follow that decision. Well, wait a minute. I was listening to a young uh, to a lady uh, yesterday. Her name is Chris Ann Hall, and I was talking to my wife about it this morning at the kitchen table. And I listened to her again last night. It's about an hour and twenty three minutes. And she's one of the most powerful attorneys in the United States of America. And if you know the reactions of Mark Levin, this lady is Mark Levin on steroids. But she's but she is she's compassionate. She's thorough. And she speaks a language that people understand. So she's indicating, she's indicating also that just because the Supreme Court says something doesn't make them right. And what Mark Levin did was, was, uh, was uh, actually set forth for us the number of occasions when the Supreme Court had already made a decision and then years later reversed it because they realized it was wrong. 
So what happens is you and I have to understand the truth. We've got to understand these things because the, tr the truth of the matter is you are sovereign. You are sovereign. I am sovereign. We are sovereign. And Lord Acton is saying, but when you put fallen sinful human beings in positions of power and authority, they will naturally tend to abuse that power and authority. And guess what? You look today and you see thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of illegal aliens coming across our border as though we had no border at all. And the question is, who's going to say something about this? Who's going to do something about this? In fact, this is criminal activity on the part of our government. It's criminal activity, and someone should go to jail. Secondly, the only thing that will prevent them, sinful human beings in positions of authority, the only thing that will prevent them from doing so, that is abusing their power and authority, is a consciousness of being of the being of God, consciousness of the being of God. In other words, they have to understand that God exists. It's the God of the Bible. If, they're, if, if these people, sinful human beings, given authority and power, are going to stop this abuse, then they're going to have to be conscious of the fact that there is a God out here, the God of the Bible, and then they must be, have a personal dependence upon the only Savior of mankind, the Lord Jesus Christ. So when you put people in office, if they don't have a consciousness of the, of the fact that God exists, if they don't understand the importance of the word of God in their life, guess what they're going to do? They will rule naturally by abusing their power and authority. And this is why when we understand this, we need to take a look out at what's going on in society and come to a conclusion. Because if, if we, we the people, do nothing about this, guess what? It's just going to eat our lunch and eventually it will simply destroy us. I have a couple of comments that I wrote down here that I want to share with you that indicates just how bad things are in this world today. Now, here again, we don't have to be upset about it. We don't have to be excited about it. We don't have to be throwing in the towel. And we don't have to be screaming out, beating our breasts. No, my goodness, what's going to happen here? We know what's going to happen. We know what the possibilities are. But are you aware of the fact that in my on my phone, this, it was either uh, s sometime yesterday, I saw this, where the CEO, the CEO of Pfizer Pharmaceuticals made the statement at the World Economic For Forum, the World Economic Forum, he made the statement that by the year 2023, I've, I heard this, I saw this, I read this, I said, wait a minute. What in the world? Can you imagine this? He said by the year 2023. Now, let me see. March, April, May, March, uh, January, February, March, April, May. That's five months. That means seven more months to 2023. And he said by 2023, we will reduce the population of the world by 50%. Did you hear that? This is what the World Economic Forum is up to. It's a one world government organization. Klaus Schwab, who is the founder and the, uh, the chairman of this particular group, the World Economic Forum, is actually promoting one world government. They use that phrase, one world government, like you and I sitting around the table talking about, you know, whatever we're talking about. This is common language for these people, driving, driving the world in this direction. And if I understood correctly, I understand that our present president is actually considering giving the, giving the oversight of our medical problems in the United States to the world health organization. Excuse me, are you listening? Chapters 10 and 11 of the book of Genesis, going back to point two, the only thing that will prevent 
sinful human beings in positions of power from abusing that power and authority is a consciousness of the being of God of the Bible and a personal dependence upon our only Savior of mankind, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. So in chapter 10 and 11 of the book of Genesis, as an example of a leader who rejected God's authority, we're going to read in chapter 10 and chapter 11 of the book of Genesis, and we're going to see an example of a leader who rejected God's authority. So this is not new. All the way back to the book of Genesis. And this man's name was Nimrod. Well, let's see. I wonder what Nimrod did to reject the authority of God. In Genesis chapter 10, verse 8, the scripture says, Cush had a son named Nimrod. So there's the son there, and his daddy's Cush. And what happened? Nimrod actually became the world's first great conqueror. You got that? That's scripture. Nimrod became the world's first great conqueror. And we have organizations right now that are leading to one world government. We have nations and religions of the world that are seeking that same kind of dominance. I can go back, and I'm going to do this sometime in the near future. I'm going to go back and point out that China, Russia, and Islam are three world powers who will be seeking the power during the time of the tribulation. Hmm, let me see now. Uh, if that happens in the tribulation, that's only seven years long, and you see what's happening today, let's see who's dominating the world today. Uh, let's see. Uh, oh, yeah, it's China. Oh, let's see. Anybody else? Uh, oh, yes, Russia. Hmm, let me see. Anybody else? Uh, oh, yes, Islam. Wait, wait a minute. Are you getting a picture? But this is not new. Nimrod, in chapter, chapter 10 of Genesis, became the world's first great conqueror. Verse 9 says, by the Lord's help, now watch this, by the Lord's help, he actually was a great hunter. So for those of you who are hunters, the Lord was helping this guy be a great hunter. And that is why the people said back at that time, oh my goodness, may the Lord make you a great hunter as Nimrod. So for those hunters out there, I would say, may the Lord make you a great hunter as Nimrod. However, stop there at the hunting, okay? Because he went on in verse 10, and it says, at first, his kingdom included, see, he was a world conqueror, okay? So at first, his kingdom included Babylon, Eric, and Akkad, all three of them in Babylonia. Then in verse 11, it says, from that land, he went to Assyria, and built the cities of Nineveh, Rehoboth, Rehoboth Ur, Kala, and in verse 12, another city, Rezin, which is between Nineveh and the great city of Kala. So, what we find here in these first few verses is this guy by the name of Nimrod became a world conqueror by the time you get to Genesis chapter 10. Then in verse 11, it says, At first, the people of the whole world had only one language and used the same word. So here he is out easy count conquering all these places. And uh, it's uh, just just a, a dominant world uh, leader. Uh, not, not good, but he's he's conquering the world. And by at that point in time, when he went to Assyria, when he went to Nineveh, when he went to Rehoboth there, when he went to Kala, hey, guess what? No matter where he went, Nineveh, where, no matter where he went, they all spoke the same language. So Genesis 11, 1 says, at first, the people of the whole world had only one language and used the same words. So if you traveled someplace, you'd have to worry about, oh, let's see, got to go to, uh, got to go to uh, some class here and learn the language. No, y'all spoke the same language. And as they wandered about in the east, the people, as they wandered around about in the east, they came to a plain in Babylon and settled there. And they said one to another, come on, hey, let's make bricks and bake them hard. We're going to make some bricks here. We're going to build something. So they had bricks to build with, their, with, and they had tar to hold them together. So in verse 4, 
is that they said, now let's build a city with a tower that reaches to the sky. Now, hold it just a second. Old Nimrod's gone out and he's conquered the world. He's a world leader. But we're going to ask ourselves, well, let's see, is this world leader? Does he, uh, he's got all this power. He's got all this authority. I wonder what he's going to be like. So he's leading these people, and they said, let's build a city and a tower that reaches the sky so that we can make a name for ourselves and not be scattered all over the earth. Huh. In steps the Lord. Then the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which they had built, and God said, now then, these are all one people, and they speak one language. This is just the beginning of what they're going to do. So God looked at him and said, Whoa, look at what these people did down here. He, he, wasn't, uh, uh, he didn't just wake up one morning and see that that's what was happening. He knew this all along, all along. But now what happened when he came down and saw this, yeah, he, 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 he just looked and there it was, okay? He said, these people speak one language. Boy, look what they've done. This isn't where they're going to stop. Soon, he says, they will be able to do anything they want, exclamation point. So he said, i uh, got a plan for that. He said, let us go down and mix up their language so they will not understand each other. So now you have English, you've got, uh, you've got Chinese, you've got Russian, you've got just the various languages of the world. Where do they come from? It was man who abused authority and attempted to unseat God and says, I'm going to be the one that's powerful. It's me that's the leader. God says, I'll show you. So what did he do? He mixed up their languages so they couldn't even understand each other. And verse 8 says, so, they, so the Lord scattered them all over the earth. Now, you can imagine that you got all these languages. Let's just so, suppose for a moment that when God did this, you've got 100 people in one location, all speaking the same language. Boy, in the next, next minute, you're talking to somebody standing beside you, don't understand what they're saying. You see the lips moving. You, you can hear them with your ears. You don't understand a word they're saying. And the next guy standing beside him turns around to talk, and you've got a hundred people in there now speaking a hundred different languages, and they don't they don't understand each other. So what do they do? Whoop! They scatter. Now you're looking for somebody out there that speaks the same language you do, so that you can have fellowship, gather together, together, and do whatever you're going to do. And so now we have people grouping together with the same language. So verse 8 says, so the Lord scattered them all over the earth and they stopped building the city. The city was called Babylon because there the Lord mixed up the language. Babel, hey, how about that? The language is okay. You take the Babel course to learn, learn a new language. The city was called Babylon because there, there the Lord mixed up the language of all the people. And from there, he scattered them all over the earth. And in point four. God had told the people to scatter and fill the earth back before Nimrod came on the scene. God told the people to scatter and fill the earth, and Nimrod decided that he'd remain right here. I'm going to stay right here and gather you people together under my authority. So the Tower of Babel was built. God came down and destroyed it, and they had to scatter. So what does this do? This clearly illustrates the truth that when leaders set themselves up in opposition to God, God isn't going to take that too long. And God brings judgment upon that group of people and then destroys them. Oh, wait a minute now. Let me see. Uh, we, ought to be, we ought to be taking a look at what's going on in our federal government. What are we taking? We should, be, we should have been taking a, a look at this all along the way. From the time you were born, the time you entered into, into school, whether it was kindergarten or the first grade, we should have been, you should have been being taught by your parents, you should have been being taught by your church, you should have been being taught by your public school system, so that by the time you became an adult, you understood all this stuff. But wait a minute. What's the issue? Not Listen, in terms of what we aren't learning, what we should have learned but didn't learn, Chris Ann Hall made a statement in that video that I was listening to last night, the, the, the very comment that I have told people 
in years past, as I was coming to learn this information and would tell people that if you go, to, if you want to become an attorney and you want to go to law school, that law schools do not teach the Constitution. Do you hear that? I've made that comment time and time again. I, I listen, I have talked to attorneys about this. Oh, no, no, they, they mentioned it here. No, you don't study it. And this is the problem. So what they what they teach, they don't teach the Constitution. They teach they teach what the courts have ruled about stuff. Not looking at the Constitution, but what have the courts ruled? How have they how have they ruled about something? And then you take that, whether it's right, wrong, or whatever. And you run with it as an attorney. And she made the, the statement boldly that they do not teach the Constitution in law school. Now, what you're going to do is you're going to come up with someone that find that actually did. There may be the exceptions, but it's the exception and not the rule. So Nimrod is not uh, uh, not the only leader who was guilty of this sin, guilty of abuse of authority. There have been many who have acted their part, uh, their part in this same way. Why? Because it's the natural tendency of sinful man that when given power and authority, he will tend to consolidate his power. And this is why when you vote for somebody, you don't vote for him because you like that person, because it's a, um, uh, just, you know, just a nice guy from a next door neighbor or whatever. No, what you want to know and what we want to know is what do you understand about the Constitution? What do you understand about our founding doctors? What do you, uh, doc, documents, what do you understand about the history of this country? And if they don't understand it, you do not vote for them. Point number two. This uh, abusive person sees his power as originating in himself and revolving around himself. And as a result, he ends up enslaving people. Look at the, look at the nations of the world. Look at what is happening in China right now, as far as they're dealing with Muslims. Look what happens around the world. Look, look what's happening in certain, in certain nations in, in, uh, in Africa. These people, these people push God aside, and they tend to take God's place. Point six says, we must state again what has been stated in, pre in previous principles in chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. This is six. But let's restate it again. Power and authority are delegated to men by God. That means mankind. Power and authority are delegated to mankind from God. God is sovereign. He is the ultimate authority. Our bullet point says that these individuals who have received delegated authority, those in power and authority are nothing more than his ministers. Hold it now, just a second. Do you hear that? Stop and stop and think about that. Those who have been those who have been elected to office, those who have been appointed to office are his ministers. They're his servants, and they are responsible to carry out their duties under his authority, which means they must understand and know that there is a God out here. They must understand that Jesus Christ is the Savior. They must understand that the Bible is the word of God given to you and I is to know how to, to live out our life. So what we should do now is stop and take a look. Take a look at your federal government. Take a look at your congressmen, your congresswomen. Take a look at the Supreme Court justices. Take a look at the cabinet with your with your president. Take a look at the uh, take a look at your governor. Take a look at the attorney general. Take a look at your county sheriff. Take a look at these things. These people are ministers of God. They're servants of God, and they're responsible to carry out their duties assigned to him by them by God and carry out his authority. Oh, my. Oh, Lord, I think I'm beginning to see a little bit what's cooking down here. What's wrong down here? Point seven, the correct outworking of 
this power and authority is that there is a balance between those in authority and the people. Now stop and think about that for just a moment. The correct outworking of this authority, this power and authority. We put someone in public office. They are ministers of God. They are God's servants. They're responsible to carry out their duties under his authority. So basically, what they're doing is they're taking, oh, this is what you want, God? Okay, I'm going to see to it as carried out down here. Well, point seven says the correct outworking of this power and authority is that there is a balance between those in authority and the people. Who are those in authority? That's the people out here, for example, in government. That's the person who's the head of the school system. That's the, pre that's the policeman on the street. That's the Supreme Court judges. There are people in authority, and there is a balance between that authority that's held by those people, a balance between that and us, we the people. So where is the balance? That doesn't mean that we have 100% of the authority and we transfer it all to them. That doesn't mean that we have 50% and they have 50%. That means we have, we have perhaps 92%. They only have 8%. But the balance is a check on each group. We check them and they check us. Whatever the, whatever the government's authority is, they're making sure we don't go astray. Guess what? You break the law, you're going to jail. You break the law, you're going to pay a fine. You traveling too fast down the highway, you're going to get a speeding ticket. So the, the, the government, those in power and authority, they're, they're seeing to it that the law is kept, and we're keeping, the, we're keeping those in authority in check because we gave them their authority. We gave them their power. And if they abuse it, you just take it back. Sub point one, the people will be free just by obeying. All we have to do, see, with the balance of power, as long as you're obeying, you're free. If you don't obey, guess what? The balance of power says you're going to jail. You're going to be fine. You're going to get a speeding ticket. You're you're not going to be able to do this or do that. You can't come here. You can't go there. So they're what they're doing is they're they're protecting our rights. The people will be free just by obeying. If those in positions of authority are honorable, now if they're not honorable. Guess what? You won't be free. You just go out and you do you do what you have a right to do, and the, the those in authority come down on you. You're not doing this. You can't do this. You can't do it anymore. See, they're not honorable. They're not functioning under God's authority. So if you really want to be free, you have liberty. If you want to be free, just obey the rules. And that will happen. You will be free as long as you have people who are honorable in positions of authority. And this concept is the key. What is the key? Those in positions of authority are honorable people. And what's honorable? It means that they recognize that they're functioning under God's authority. They're carrying out that authority the way he would do that. Subpoint two, without submission and obedience to God's law by those in power. So if Donald Trump, Joe Biden, Bill Clinton, oh, excuse me, wait a minute. FDR, Nancy Pelosi, without submission to the obedience of God's law by those in power and also those by the people, liberty leads to confusion. Ooh, let's ask this. What's it like in our country today? Hmm. Any confusion around here? So without submission and obedience to God's law by those in power, those on the state, the federal, the county, the municipality, the town, whatever you want to call it, without submission to God uh, and obedience to God's law by those in power and by those in those people, guess what? Liberty leads to confusion. So in short, there can be no true liberty without submission and obedience to God's law by those people in power and by you and me. There can be no true liberty. Sub point eight. 
We've stated that God's government, or that government rather, we have stated that government is there to do what? Government, oh, stop and listen to this, please. Listen. We have stated that government is there. Government is what it is to praise those who do good and to punish those who do evil. That's the purpose of government. Not to control your life. Not to tell you what you can and can't say. What happened to the freedom of speech? What happened to the freedom of religion? What happened to the freedom to assemble? What happened to the freedom to, to go to our government and, and complain about what's going on? What happened? So we've stated that government is there to praise those who do good and punish those who do evil. God intends that, listen to this, God intends that evil should be dealt with in society. This is the angelic conflict. These are God's rules. But what happens is when you're not taught by your parents, when you're not taught by your school system, when you're not taught by your church, when you're not taught by college, when you're not taught by law school, guess what? Evil needs to be punished. And God intends that evil should be dealt with in society. It should be dealt with justly. Point nine says when, when leaders deal with evil and punish it, listen to this, when leaders deal with evil and they punish it. So in other words, when, when an infraction has taken place and a fair punishment has been meted out, what can you say about that? Here it is. It's redemptive for society. It's redemptive for society. So when, when leaders deal with evil and punish it, society, society has, has peace. It has time to do what we want to do. It's payback time. When people break the law, it should be punished. Now, you have to ask yourself, depending on what news channel you're watching, whether that's actually occurring in our country today. Are those who doing evil being punished? Are those who doing good being praised? Are we punishing those who are doing good and praising those who are doing evil? When leaders deal with evil and punish it, it is redemptive for society. It liberates society from the curse, and if the curse is the curse of evil. How about throwing a Molotov cocktail through some store window? How about looting that store? That belongs to somebody. That stuff you're carrying out of there doesn't belong to you. There's no, no legitimate reason to be able to do this. That's government's responsibility. Point 10 says, as such, it, leaders punishing evil, as, punish, as leaders punish evil, this is an extension of God's rule and an act of worship of him. Stop there, please. Don't let that go by you. Leaders punishing evil is an extension of God's rule. So what we have is God up here. You saw what he did. You saw what he did to Nimrod. You saw what he did to the people. God says, scatter. They said, no, we're going to gather. We're not going to scatter. We're going to gather. Oh, by the way, look here. We got some stuff over here. We're going to make some bricks. We're going to make a tower here. Oh, we're going to build it all the way to the sky. We're going to build it all the way up there to God. We're going to go see who he is, what he's, what he's, what he's doing up there, okay? God said, no, you're not. So he took the language, punishment. He altered their languages. He scattered them all over the face of the earth. So what we need to do understand is this. When God is a ruler, he gives authority to you and me, 
And if I've got this authority, I've got to do down here what he would do if I wasn't in the middle. So leaders punishing evil is an extension of God's rule. He's actually ruling through this individual. Everything he would he would do or want done is getting done according to his guideline. So leaders punishing evil is an extension of God's rule and an act of worship to him. You are when when government when uh, leaders punish evil that is w- worshiping God. You don't have to go to a building. Isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing? You don't have to go to to a, a building and sing sing songs and dance and jump up and down and throw your arms in the air and weep. No, 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 no. Just punish evil. That's an act of worshiping God. Leaders punishing evil is exactly what God intended for earthly authority. That's what God wanted out of authority. God said, I'm going, to get, I'm going to delegate authority to man. We need government out here, and we need government to protect, protect us from evil. So leaders punishing evil is exactly what God intended for earthly authority. And when people who are violating the law and don't receive punishment, they get away, just get away with it. Oh, that's okay. I see who you are. Yeah, let's see. Your dad is, uh, yeah, well, that's okay. You Wait a minute. Uh, would you do it? Wait a minute, I just did what that person did. Oh, no, it doesn't make any difference. Look who you are. You, and you get punished. So when leaders set themselves up as ultimate authority, point 11, they end up calling evil good and good evil. Listen to that. When leaders set themselves up as the ultimate authority. See, that's when you get rid of God. I'm taking over. I got this thing. When leaders set themselves up as ultimate authority, they end up calling evil good and good evil. (laughs) Let me ask you this. Do you think global warming is is going to end the world here in 10 years? Do you think that what much of what our government is doing today is what God would do? Is what our government is calling good, is it really good or is it evil? Evil is simply a distortion of truth. Just understand this. Isaiah 5.20 said, whoa, hold it now. Look what it says. Let's read point 11 again. When leaders set themselves up as the ultimate authority, See, this is this is why today, if you were to try to check, oh no, you no, don't come through my door. Don't you come in here to try to come confiscate my guns. Don't you come in here and try to take my computers away. No, no, no. No, you stay right there at the door. When leaders set themselves up as ultimate authority, no, get out of the way. I'm gonna bust your door down. Get out of the way. I am the authority here. No, they're not. But when they set themselves up as ultimate authority, they end up calling evil good and good evil. And watch what God says. God says, you are doomed. It's all over. You are doomed. Who's doomed? You call evil good and call good evil. You've turned darkness into light and light into darkness. You you make what is bittersweet and what, what is sweet, you make bitter. See, they just turn it around. These are people who are pretending to be the ultimate authority. But you and I have to understand, this is not so. They are not. God said to Nimrod, he didn't say it to him, but it's what happened. You're doomed. You don't take my place. You don't tell me to move over. See, that's what Satan did. And he's going to get his in the end. Yes, he's going to get his. God's going to win the angelic conflict on his time schedule. So he said, you're doomed. You you call good evil and evil good. Just stop and take a look at what's going on today. In point 12, the leaders who set themselves up as the ultimate authority make gods of themselves. 
That's the whole chapter one of the book of Romans. Leaders setting themselves up as the ultimate authority. See, this is why when you when the when the parents don't get taught, they can't teach the children. The children go to go to school. They don't get it. They don't get. They are not taught there. The church is failing. They're not teaching this. Oh no, pastor, don't talk about politics. No, no, no. We're going to lose our five hundred one c three. No, pastor, if you open your mouth one more time, we're going to call a deacons meeting, and you will be gone from here. You don't talk about politics in the church. Excuse me. Did somebody rip chapter 13 out of the Romans out of the Bible? Excuse me. Did someone tear up the Old Testament? Daniel rejecting? Moses rejecting? Excuse me. So this is what we're seeing today. Leaders setting themselves up as the ultimate authority, making gods of themselves. But here's the issue. You'll never see you'll never see this. You'll never see this. If you are buying the lies and deception of fake news. See, fake news is not telling you that. Huh? Fake news is not telling you what you need to know. Again, I'm going to say it again. MSNBC, CNN, ABC, CBS, NBC, The Washington Post, New York Times. And the Marxist progressive left on the rhinos in Washington. This is how bad it is. And if I if I understood correctly what I listened to yesterday in a video that's over over a, 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 an hour long, a certain organization that is privy to some information and talking about what might happen in the United States as early as the as November when you take a look at what what China's doing where it's going most people this information would scare the people to death but that's not where we're coming from god is in control of the entire scenario and all he asks us to do is to be what we need to be. We need to work out his plan in our life where there is peace and joy and comfort, happiness in the midst of the storm. There is a very, very conservative news media, and that's Newsmax. Point 13. And if you happen to be superstitious, just cover up the 13, okay? Leaders who set themselves up as the ultimate authority consolidate power and refuse to acknowledge the distinctions that God has put in place. Listen to me, please. Leaders who set themselves up as the ultimate authority. This is why many people out here have never heard of the World Economic Forum, the WEF. They don't understand WHO, who WHO is. They don't understand what the World Economic Forum is up to. They don't understand what the, the World Health Organization is up to. They don't understand D Dr. Fauci and others. Oh, no, no, don't don't talk about them, Dr. Jim. No, you see, you're getting in areas where you should, excuse me. Leaders set, who set themselves up as the ultimate authority, what do they do? They promote globalism. That's what's happening today. They promote globalism when, it's God, when God's intention is to set boundaries. Oh, wait a minute. Boundaries? Hold it just a second. Leaders who set themselves up as ultimate authority promote globalism, one world government. See, that's a big deal today. When God's intention is not globalism, it's to set boundaries. You cross this boundary here, you're in the wrong area. God's intention is to set boundaries around the different nations and make them make them separate. Listen to Acts 17, 26. And he made from one man every nation. Wait a minute. How can you call something a nation if it doesn't have a boundary? This was the beauty of Chris Ann Hall in that hour speech that she gave. So clear, so, so easy to understand. But the problem is people don't think. 
And he, he made he made God made from one man, that's Adam, every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having the de- watch this, having determined their appointed times and boundaries of their habitation. Excuse me, did you see that? Did you hear that? Oh no, we don't have no, we don't have a boundary. No, just come on, everybody come. Excuse me. Do you have any idea why that's happening? Do you have any idea what the present administration is seeking, wanting to pack the court with liberal judges? One of the things that Chris Ann Hall mentioned is you're cited for you're cited for some sort of a uh, of a uh, a violation, say in the state of in the state of Arkansas, and they take you to federal court who has no jurisdiction. And guess what? You go to federal court, and all you have is liberal judges. You are guilty, whether you're guilty or not. Wait a minute, we just don't understand that, do we? Who has jurisdiction over this? Well, huh? One of the things that was mentioned. How many people in whatever state you live in have ever read the state constitution and understand your declaration of rights? And the declaration of rights in your state constitution may not agree and may be maybe uh, more, more abundant, more clear than some general comment in the in the uh, in the Ten Amendments in the Bill of Rights, but wait a minute! I've never read the Bill of Rights for our Declaration of Rights for our state. Why not? Seventeen twenty six says again, and he made made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and boundaries of their habitation, that they would seek God. Now listen, isn't that amazing? that they would seek God if perhaps they might feel around for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and exist. In him we live and move and exist. Angelic conflict. As even some of your own poets have said, for we are also his descendants. The next bullet point. One world, gov- one world government is anti-God, anti-Christ, and God will destroy it. Here's a quote. Here's a quote from the World Economic Forum. Klaus Schwab, the man who founded it, he is a German. That's okay, but he's a German. He says, the time has come for world governments to unite as one and tackle global problems such as climate change, trade, and economic distru- disruption without hindrance or delay. De- hold it without hindrance or delay. That means now, today. Well, when did he say that? He said this on Wednesday, um, uh, Wednesday, March the 30th. This is May, March, April, May. He made this statement on Wednesday, March the 30th, 2022. The time has come for world governments to unite. Come on, United States, get in on this. Oh, yes, let's see. Uh, uh, our president says, yeah, we, let's, turn, let's turn over the medical, the medical issues uh, of our nation. Uh, let's turn that over to the World Health Organization. Oh, really? I don't think so. Point 14. The problem we face today is that many in positions of government do not know God and have no understanding of his being or his law. Hold it. You hear that? So when you're voting for people, do you know what they believe? Do you know what they understand? Have you seen them face to face? Has anybody asked them what they believe? I hate to tell you some of the things I've been told when I've asked these people. What do you believe about this? What do you believe about this? Good gracious. Well, the problem we face today is that many in positions of government, and this doesn't make any difference whether they're Democrats, whether they're Republicans, whether they're um, Libertarians, what are they? The problem is, is that they don't know who God is. They have no understanding of his being, and they have no understanding of 
his law. So what makes it worse is the fact that they have no desire to know him and no desire to submit to his authority. Many in positions of government are quite content in pursuing, you've heard this before, what are they doing? They're pursuing their own lust for power, wealth, and status. And we talk about the three Ps. Because of the old sin nature, people pursue pleasure. They're trying to prevent pain and pursuing power. Forget God. We don't want to know him. We don't care about him. We don't care about his authority. No, what I want to do is I want to seek pleasure. Ooh, what is, what, where can I find pleasure? Oh, and I tell you what, I got all this pain. I'm trying to find something to take care of all my pain. How about this? I'm trying to pursue power. There you go. There's the government. Point 16 says the only way for us, the only way for us to experience national renewal is get back to the fundamentals. So in 15 points going through this, the natural tendency of, of government to pursue power. To abuse their authority. To control everything around them. The only way for us to experience renewal, national renewal, is get back to the fundamentals. And the fundamentals are the following. And here's what, now, look here. When we, when we look here at point one, two, and three, okay, when we look at these three points, What we're indicating is this is the way we're going to get back to where we used to be. This is this is where we're going. This is what we're going to have to do to get back to where we are were when this nation was founded. First of all, we have to recognize that all human beings are sinners. You ask people, ask people today if they think they are. Well, what is sin? You know, what, what is that? I don't know what all that is. I don't know. Well, if we're ever going to restore this nation to where it, where it should be, get it back to where it was, first of all, people are going to have to understand that all human beings are sinners. Secondly, as we're all created by God and are accountable to him, now hang on. We were created by him in Adam, okay? We, Adam was created, we're born. But humanity was created. So as we're all created by God in Adam, all are accountable to God. Because man was created by God, we are accountable to God. Not just Adam, but all of us. Remember the angelic conflict? We're here to resolve the conflict. So as we're all created by God and accountable to him, we need to repent. Now, what we need to understand is what repentance is, because people use this word repent when they actually mean feel sorry for sin, beat your breast, weep, pour out tears because of your past. No, the word repent means to change your mind about something. So if we're going to restore this nation, all those in government, all those outside of government in the United States, our people are going to have to repent. Change your mind about our sin and call it what it is. Sin is sin. But if we don't know the word of God, we can't tell what sin is. This is why we need to change our mind. This is why doctrine is so important to us. So we need... For, we need to recognize we're all sinners. Then we need to repent, change your mind about sin, call it what it is. Then from there on, we need to turn from it, turn from sin. And how are you going to turn from sin? First, you, you change your mind about sin. Now you turn away from it. And the way you turn away from it is use Operation Recovery. So if you have only been with me for a short period of time, you may not understand Operation Recovery. But what that means is 1 John 1, 9, you must confess your sin, name that sin. Don't beat your breast. Don't go weeping and wailing. You name it. Lord, I lied. I cheated. I, I stole. I raped. I murdered. I did 
you name it, and God forgives it. That's what Jesus did for you on the cross. You don't go to somebody and tell them, oh, my goodness, I, I did this, I did that, and say, okay, you're forgiven. No, no, no. You simply name it to God. You can think it. You don't have to speak it. Think it. God hears you. You name it. So when you have named all your sins, that is, since the, remember, at the moment of salvation, you said, I believe in Jesus. He wipes all that away. It's gone forever. You may remember it. He said, I don't remember. He said, I've cast it as far as the east is from the west. Never to think about it anymore. After salvation, now that you're saved, you know you lied. You know you cheated. You know you did this. You, what did you do? You knew you were angry. You knew you were anxious. You knew you were worried. You knew you were bitter. You knew you punched that person. You name it. Lord, this is what I did. He says, you're forgiven. Now what happens is that's your, that your neutral person doing that. Now you have to yield yourself to God, the Holy Spirit, through Operation Cry, knowing your old man was crucified with Christ. You reckon that so. You reckon that you have a new man, new man or new woman inside. That's not transgenderism, spirituality. No, it's if you're a woman, you have a new woman. If you're a man, you have a new man. And then you yield to God, the Holy Spirit, which puts you in the sphere of the Spirit. And now what do you do? Our author said you plead for, plead his forgiveness. No, you don't plead his forgiveness. I don't agree with that. You're already in the you're already in the sphere of the spirit. What you do is point B there. You use rebound. You use Operation Cry, and then you apply pertinent doctrine to the circumstances of life. There you are. This is how you turn around. But it's turning around one person at a time. So I encourage you to look at that. Then sub point three here, which is the third the third deal. Point one says we, we have to recognize we're sinners. Point two said we're created by God and we need to be accountable to him. So your accountability is changing your mind about sin, turning away from that sin. And then we, when we Americans do this individually and as a nation, point one and two, when we do this individually and and as a nation. So what that means, you start, start up here at the top of the list, and you say, Angie, have you done that? Bob and Wilma, have you done that? Uh, uh, Leanne, have you done that? Brian, have you done that? Jim, have you done that? Go just sit down the list. If this nation is going to be restored, we have to have done that. I would say that each one of us on this page have done that. But what we need to realize is people out there don't know this and don't understand that. And when you take a look out there and realize that they don't understand, they're not doing that, you can just, you can go to the bank. God's going to whack this nation and it won't be long till Jesus comes back and we're out of here. If that's, if that's God's time schedule. But in the meantime, as long as we're here, things aren't going to get better. They're going to get worse if we don't individually turn around and as the nation doesn't turn around see the pivot has to be big enough for god to say wait a minute i can spare them again just for a period of time so when we americans do this individually as a nation and as a nation we americans will once again experience god's blessing upon our country the united states of america but if we don't do this individually and those of us who are in that pivot if you're in it if the nation doesn't turn around and the pivot isn't big enough, it's not going to happen. Well, that actually finishes the, this particular message. So let me go back here for just a minute because I've got about, about six minutes left. Let me go back to the top. The natural tendency of government. What did Lord Acton say? Power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. He also said authority does not exist for liberty. Is not authority, but force. See, if authority isn't if authority doesn't exist for liberty, it's not authority. It's forced. Then what we have is the abuse of power by people in people in government because they don't understand God, they don't understand his plan. We see here that God intends evil to be dealt with in society. People who fail, people who fail God, 
nations have failed God. He says you're doomed. He actually indicates in Acts 17 that we have boundaries in this country. But I've got something else I want to share with you just briefly. And um, let me let me go down here and get this. I want to um, I want to share uh, share with you some quotes. These are quotes from Lord Acton, the man that we were talking about at the beginning of the class, the uh, the the one who studied the history of liberty. He said, "Power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely." He said, "Great men are almost always bad men, even when they exercise influence." and not authority. You hear that? Great men almost always are bad men, even when they exercise influence and not authority. Still more, when you super add the tendency of the certainty of corruption by authority. He says, despotic power is always accompanied by corruption of morality. Get that? Despotic power is always accompanied by corruption of morality. He said, authority that does not exist for liberty is not authority, but force. These things have to be understood and applied. Everybody likes to get as much power as circumstances allowed, and nobody will vote for a self-denying ordinance. In other words, if you've got, a, if you've got a, a, an ordinance out here that says, uh, you know, you're going to have to self-deny here, I'm not voting for that. No, no, no. He said, absolute power demoralizes. Liberty and freedom. Liberty becomes a question of morals more than politics. Liberty becomes a question of morals more than politics. Liberty is the harmony. Remember the difference between liberty and freedom? Liberty is the harmony between the will and the law. Property, not conscience, is the basis of liberty. For the defense of conscious, conscience need not arise. Property is always exposed to interference. It is the constant ob object of policy. Liberty has not, not only enemies which it conquers. Listen, liberty has not only enemies which it conquers, but perfidious friends who rob the fruits of its victory, absolute democracy, socialism. In other words, what is absolute democracy? What is socialism? Liberty has not only enemies which it conquers, but perfidious friends who rob the fruits of its victories. Who's robbing the fruits of the victories of, of, of liberty? Democracy and socialism. He said all liberty is conditional. Liberty are limited and therefore unequal. The state can never do what it likes in its own sphere. It is bound by all kinds of law. Liberty consists in the division of power, absolutism, in concentration of power. I, I There... I want to go down. How about this on America? Quotes about America. In, in, in England, Parliament is above the law. Parliament is above the law in England. Hold it. That means, uh, let's see, Congress is above the law in the United States. Is that right? In America, the law is above Congress. The Americans have broken the thread. In, they broke the thread in 1776. In other words, governments were just about the same. But in 1776, the Americans said, nope, they broke the thread, spliced it together again. They became eminently conservative in 1787. The great novelty of the American Constitution was that it imposed checks on the representatives of the people. What the French took from the Americans was their theory of revolution. The French, America, the, our people re revolted. So the French took our, took our theory of revolt not our theory of government, they're cutting, not they're sowing. In other words, they they cut, they didn't sow, they didn't build. There could never be a revolution less provoked by oppression than America. Thenceforth, the right of a nation to judge for itself cannot be denied. How about this one? Americans dreaded democracy. Good gracious, are you listening to that? Americans dreaded democracy and contrived their constitution against it. Our constitution is not forming a democracy. Our constitution, our Declaration of Independence, but specifically our constitution formed 
a constitutional republic. We are a nation of laws. We're not governed by man. We're governed by law. Well, it's time to time to close. Going back to the to our subject again, the subject, the tendency of government is to do what? It's to corrupt. It's not to do what God wants. We need to be aware of that. Father, good gracious. My heart is pounding. I th I know that our people, Father, I'm I'm speaking to the choir. I'm speaking to the choir, Father. I believe that. But when we look out, we have to understand what in the world is going on. And we who understand, the choir can go out and sing your message. Not sing it. But we can go out and sing your message to people who may be looking for truth. There may be one here, one there. 15 over here that don't care. But lead us to those people who want to know the truth. Because in fact, when the rapture occurs, it's not too late, but oh my goodness. It'd be just like hell on earth. And yet hell is even worse than what's going to happen in the tribulation. Lead us to the people who want the truth. Lead those people to us, Father who want relief from the circumstances of life. But listen, if we're going to understand what's going on in this country, we have to understand what's being taught, what's being taught here. We're going to have to give up some of our time to, to study and to learn and to apply if we want the individual peace that will come to us because we know the truth, because the truth will set us free. Thank you, Father, for this time in Christ's name. Amen. Folks, as I close this out, and I'm going to shut off our sound and stuff, this was not an easy lesson for me to teach. It was not an easy lesson. I'm just praying that God, the Holy Spirit, will take it and use it for God's honor and glory in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. We'll see you this coming Wednesday.